Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, the ham and mayhem. It's mayhem. Not if it ruins a gag. Hi, Helen. Hi. What are you doing? Oh, trying to spot a client. I've done everything to get somebody up here, set traps... Hung out of the window by my toes. Nothing. Oh, is it that bad, Rick? Has been for a week. Can I come over tonight and cry on your shoulder? I'd love it. Better wear a bathing suit. Are you going to cry that much? No, but the bathing suit will sure make me feel a lot better. <laughs> you idiot. Yeah, I can't help it. I try so hard. Are you really coming over? If I cry long enough, I'll work up a heck of an appetite. I'll have Francis fix you a good dinner. I'll pay you back with the first client I get. We'll eat out? No, I'll have Francis fix you dinner. <laughs> What time will you be over? Uh, Mr. Diamond? Rick? Shh. I think I've spotted one. Client? I'm afraid to ask. It might scare him away. Are you Richard Diamond, the private detective? Are you interested in hiring him? I certainly am. Rick? We just made a score, baby. I'll see you tonight. Oh, wonderful. Bye. Well, uh, come in, sir. Come in. No sense in standing in a draft. Might catch pneumonia before we get around to my fee. Uh, my name is John Alistair. Well, sit down, Mr. Alistair. Pull up a wallet. Uh, a chair. Uh, thank you, now, uh, what can I do for you? Uh, quite a lot, I hope. Two days ago, I made arrangements for my own assassination. Huh? It's really very simple. Well, so am I sometimes. Maybe you better be a little bit more specific. Well, I was bankrupt, in danger of going to prison. Uh, I have a family, a wife and two children. And an insurance policy. That's right. Mm. If I was to be killed, my family would be well taken care of. You said you were in danger of going to prison. Why? Well, I'll be perfectly honest. I embezzled money from my firm. Oh, embezzlement. Well, you can get a lot of years for that. Yes. So I decided to do away with myself, leaving instructions for my wife to replace the stolen funds. She could live quite comfortably on the rest. I knew suicide would revoke the insurance policy, so I went to the only underworld character I knew, a, a man named Gimpy. A long time ago, he'd been my bootlegger. Oh, yeah, I know. He nearly poisoned me once. I told Gimpy I wanted to hire a man to kill me, a professional assassin. Gimpy said it could be done, and I gave him $200. I told Gimpy to take care of the arrangements and not to tell me anything about the man who was going to kill me. I didn't want to know a thing. How it would be done or when. Well, what do you want me for? Well, something has happened. My wife's brother arrived last week from South America, a very wealthy man, and advanced me enough money to pay back the firm and make a fresh start. Well, then go tell Gimpy to call the gunman off. Have you read the morning papers, Mr. Diamond? No. Here, front page. Gimpy was shot to death last night. Oh. Oh, it's kind of tough, then, to tell Gimpy to call it off, hmm? I want you to find whoever Gimpy hired and stop him from killing me. Find a man with the only clue to his identity lying dead in a morgue? He could be one of 50 professional killers wandering the streets. One of 50 who would make it tough to be found even if you just wanted the time of the day. Who can you find him? I don't know. I can try. You must find him before he kills me. Well, I'll try my best. In the meantime, you stay here and lock yourself in. In this office? Yep, right here. Don't even let your wife know where you are. All right, if, if you think it's necessary. No, I think it is. And, uh, <clears throat> by the way, I, I charge a hundred a day in expenses. I guess his brother-in-law had given him enough money for a high-priced private detective because he handed me a hundred dollars and agreed to lock my door and not answer it for anyone but me. I left the office and headed for the Skid Row Bistro where Gimpy had died on the dirty floor. It was called Black and Red, and the bartender was wearing an apron that looked like he'd been making hash on it. Yeah, Gimpy got killed here. Right over there, the clean spot near the bar. He bled a little. You know who gunned him? What am I answering your questions for? Because I'm asking him. That ain't enough. I got a fetish for living. Hmm. I'm a, I'm a private cop. Oh, that's the worst thing you could have said. You better buy a beer or take a walk, huh? I'll buy. You don't even have to change the ten bucks. You think I'd tell you something for a lousy ten fish? Yeah. Well, you're wrong. I don't know nothing. You were in here, weren't you? Yeah. 
on my stomach behind the bar. You saw it start, didn't you? You want me to tell you as much as I know? Unless you want to play another tune. We could dance. Ten bucks for what I know? You don't think it's worth it, huh? Nah. But I seen the ten and it made me greedy. Okay. Here. Live a little. Thanks. Well, Kimpy was standing over there drinking a beer. These two guys come in and one of them walks up to him. What did they look like? Two guys, big guys, hats, coats with the collars stained up, the whole bit. Looked like just what they was. This one guy started arguing with Gimpy about some money. You hear the conversation? Yeah, something about wanting all the 200. Well, Gimpy gets a little nasty. He was like that, you know, a nasty little guy. Well, the guy gets tired of arguing and pulls a gun. Gimpy tries to climb the bar, and he must have been halfway over when the guy cut him in two. By then, I was flat on my face waiting for mine. But these two guys took off, and I called the cops. Wait the ten. You don't remember what either one of the guys looked like? Nah, I was mine to my health. Mm. Okay, thanks. Uh, hey. Yeah? Uh, I don't know whether it means nothing, but the guy who killed Gimpy was wearing a small red flower in his buttonhole. A red flower like a rosebud. I remember it. <laughs> Funny a guy like that should be wearing a pretty flower. <laughs> What do you want? Why, Sergeant Otis, you've been taking your ugly pills again. Can't you ever do anything without the department's help? I thought you were supposed to be a big, smart private detective. Well, we all make mistakes. I thought you were supposed to be a gorilla. Oh, you did, huh? Yeah, but gorillas get bigger. Oh. Hello, all. Hello, Rick. What can I do for you? I got a little problem. Your department handled that killing over in the black and red saloon? Skid Row? Yeah. Yeah, a small-time guy named Gimpy got himself blown up. Mm-hmm. Any line on the killer? No, we questioned the bartender who runs the place. He was lying on his face. Couldn't give much of a description. We're checking up on Gimpy's friends and associates. The killer wore a small red flower in his buttonhole. Maybe a rose. How do you know? Bartender told me. Thought maybe you knew about it. Well, he didn't tell me. What are you interested in Gimpy for? Uh, he contacted the killer. I've got to find the killer, and I don't know who he is. You think maybe this guy with the flower is your boy? Well, he might be. Bartender said he was arguing with Gimpy about $200. Well, no, he didn't tell me that either. Just said they were arguing. You should have slipped him 10 bucks. What do you have to find him for? Client. You got a client who wants you to find a killer? Yeah, and that's all I'm going to tell you. Now, give me what you got on Gimpy and his friends. I don't know why I should. Oh, stop pouting, fatty. I can't tell you anymore. Besides, if I find this killer, you solve the Gimpy killing, don't you? Well, yeah. Well, then let's have it. Okay. Gimpy didn't have many friends. The only sure one we've come up with is a woman named Belle DeCanto. Runs a small dancing school. Have you talked to her? Yeah, but she knows less than the bartender. Here's the address. Walt gave me Belle DeCanto's address, and I went over. It was an old two-story building on the east side with a rickety flight of stairs leading up to the dance studio. Belle DeCanto was sitting at the piano. I stood there smoking a camel, watched one of her young pupils perform a pretty sloppy set of turns. All right, Jeannie, that was fine. Over to the bar. Okay. Hey. Huh? Oh, somebody. Oh, what can I do for you? I want to talk to you, Bill. Twenty bucks for ten lessons. I just want to talk. Why don't you take the lessons, mister? Gives you grace and balance. I look a little silly in tights, dear. Go do your exercises, Jeannie. Okay, but I still think you'd look great in tights, mister. We could do Swan Lake and things. I bet we could. Talk him into it, Bill. He's real cute. What do you want to talk about? Gimpy. You a cop? Private cop. I entertained the whole 5th precinct all morning. I'm looking for the guy who killed Gimpy. I told the cops all I know. I don't know who killed Gimpy. Back straight, honey. Okay. I can't help you, mister. You know a man who wears a red flower in his buttonhole? Huh? Do you know a man who wears a red... I'm busy, mister. I got a lesson. Look, Bell. I don't know nothing. Now beat it. Maybe if I bought a course of lessons. I'm full out. Now get out of here. I told you to keep your back straight. Okay, okay. I'm keeping it. Bell. 
You going to get out of here or do I call the law? Oh, Bill, what you throwing him out for? You shut up and keep your back straight. Listen, I'm paying good money around here. Get out now, mister. Okay. What you climbing on me for, huh? So what are you yelling? You'll get up there and do your better or bust this cane over your skull. You'll do what? I told your old lady I'd teach you how to dance, and I will if I have to cripple you trying. You don't yell at me like that. Bye, you lovely people. Bye, honey. You don't yell at me. I paid my money. Who do you think you are? Who? Get up on that bar! Drop dead! <laughs> It was pretty obvious my mention of the man with the red flower had set off Belle de Canto's charming temper. And it was even more obvious that to Belle, the man with the red flower spelled some kind of trouble. The third and most obvious point was that I wouldn't get anything out of Belle even if I dropped her in a pit full of enraged mice. I started down the steps of the dance studio heading for the street, and I stopped cold. Something on the third step set off little bells in the space in my head reserved for danger. There, on the third step, was a small red rose, and it hadn't been there when I went in. I stopped and thought about it. Maybe the man I wanted was in the building. I looked around. Only one other door besides the studio, and that led to Bell's apartment above. I went up there and looked around. Nothing. Then I got a pretty scary thought. Maybe the man with the red rose had tailed me, waited around, listening at the door. If he'd found me, maybe he'd found my client. I spent the next 20 minutes making myself hard to follow, and when I was satisfied no one was tailing me, went back to my office. Alistair. Mr. Alistair. Uh, who is it? Diamond. Open up. Uh, how do I know it's Diamond? Well, you are being cautious. You gave me a hundred dollar retainer. I told you to lock yourself in my office and not to answer to anybody but me. Did you find out anything? Uh, close it and lock it. Is something wrong? Well, the man who killed Gimpy was wearing a red flower in his buttonhole. I met an old biddy who runs a dancing school, and when I mentioned the flower, she froze up like a clam in a barrel of glue. Who is this man with the flower? I don't know, but before he killed Gimpy, he argued with him about some money. Two hundred dollars. Well, that's the amount I paid Gimpy to hire the assassin. Yeah. I think the man with the flower is probably your killer. And when I left the dance studio, I found this. A red rose? Uh-huh. I think maybe he's tailing me. He knows I came to see you. I don't know. I think he's found out I'm looking for him. Maybe figures I'm trying to catch him for killing Gimpy. Anyway, you're not the only one on the spot now. But what'll we do? If he's looking for me, there's no sense in letting him find you, too. You gotta get out of here. But where? Well, an out-of-the-way hotel, I know. Manager's a friend of mine. But... What if this killer finds you? That's a good question. I hustled John Alistair out on the fire escape and we climbed down to the floor below, just in case our boy with the red rose was waiting outside my office. We climbed into the seventh floor hall, made our way to the service elevator and down to the alley. A half an hour later, I'd deposited Alistair in room number 11 of the Bunker Hill Hotel in charge of the manager a one-time safecracker named Herman Clip. I'd done a lot of favors for Herman, and he assured me Alistair would be safe, and that no one would be allowed to see him unless his name was Diamond, and he had the bluest eyes in the private detective business. It was six o'clock by the time I left the hotel, and I kept to the side streets in case the man with the red rose might be close. It was certainly one way of finding him, letting him find me. But I wanted to be ready for it, and I didn't want to be around my client when it happened. I went back to my apartment on 51st Street. Hello, chum. I've been waiting for you. Oh, that's nice. Lonesome? Eh, for a while. You had that nice big gun to keep you company. Sure, sure. Mm. You forgot to wear your rose. You got the wrong boy, Diamond. Drago's busy. Drago? Name won't do you any good. I'm going to kill you. Drago's the boy with the red rose? Turn on the radio. You were the guy with him in the bar when he killed Gimpy. Yeah, that's right. Turn on the radio. Okay, okay. Look, uh, tell Drago he doesn't have to kill John Alistair. Alistair says to call it off. The radio, the radio. Oh, sure. Will you tell him? 
See, I tell him, but I don't think he's going to do any good. You see, he knows Alastair talked to you. We know you've been trying to find him, and we don't want anybody who can pin Gimpy's killing on us. I didn't tell Alistair anything. Sure, sure. Where you got him hidden out, huh? Eh? Yeah, we find out. Drago shouldn't have knocked off Gimpy like that, but he, he gets excited. Like running out of the bar before he knocked off the bartender. If we had knocked off the bartender right then, he couldn't have told you nothing. What about the bartender? He's in the river. Turn the radio up. I turned the radio up slowly. My mind working triple time. The guy behind me wanted the music to cover the noise, like a funeral march with a one-gun salute. I heard him get up behind me. All right, turn around. It had to be quick. I turned and gave him the radio right in the face. <laughs> I had twisted his gun right into his stomach. <laughs> he looked up at me like a kid who was going to bust out crying because somebody had dumped over his blocks. Then he slid down on his face and died without a sound. I put in a fast call to Walt, told him to check his files for a killer named Drago. I told him what had happened and about the bartender who was probably floating on the river. Then I took off for Belle DeCanto's dance studio. The man I'd just killed had said Drago wasn't going to leave anyone around who might pen the gimpy killing on him. And Drago had left his red rose on the steps outside of Bell's studio. When I got there, the big dance hall was dark. So I went up another flight to Bell's apartment. Well, here goes. Bell was there all right, and Drago had been there. He hadn't left a rose, but he left a bullet instead. It was somewhere in Bell DeCanto's heart. Before we continue with Richard Diamond, here is an important question. How mild can a cigarette be? One puff won't tell you. One sniff won't tell you. It takes day in, day out smoking to find out how well a cigarette agrees with your throat. Only camels offer you this day in, day out smoking proof. In a coast-to-coast -coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only camels for 30 days, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Make your own camel 30-day test, the one sensible, thorough cigarette test. Smoke only camels for 30 days and let your taste tell you how rich and flavorful camels are, puff after puff, pack after pack. Let your throat tell you how mild camels are, how well camels get along with your throat as a steady smoke. You'll see why people say, once a camel smoker, always a camel smoker. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Well, here's all the information, Rick. The only man we got on file named Drago is a well-known hood named Tommy Drago. Mm -hmm. Seven arrests, two convictions, assault, and armed robbery. Can you find him all? Well, I put out an APB. Maybe we'll pick him up. You find the bartender? They're dragging the river now. Mm -hmm. The guy in your apartment has been identified as Julio Bassadi, arrested once with Drago. Supposed to work together. Yeah. Why did Drago kill Bell DeCanto? Well, probably thought I'd told her something. Now we gotta get this boy. He's killed three people in two days. And he wants to add two more to his list. Me and my client. Where is your client? Oh, he's staked out in the Bunker Hill Hotel. He's safe. Well, we better pick him up and give him protection. He doesn't want the police brought in. But you can stake out a couple of men near the hotel in case Drago shows up. Right. Look, uh, Walt, if this Drago likes red roses, he must buy them someplace. Yeah? Well, have some men check all the flower shops. Have them circulate the description. For 
For the rest of the day and into the evening, the entire precinct turned out to look for Drago. Each man had a photograph, and they toured every flower store in the city, showing the photograph and asking questions. Walt and I even took one section, wore out a lot of pavement and several good inches of shoe leather, trying to find someone who might have been selling the roses to Drago. By six o'clock, we were back in the precinct, discouraged, and as Walt said... Oh, I'm beat. Yeah. You want some coffee? Yeah, yeah, might as well. We took in 12 shops. Here. Thanks. Looks like the guy grows his own. Well, maybe he does. Swell, I'll put out a general to pick up every window box and flower pot in the city. We're bound to catch him in 10 or 12 years. Yeah, what do you want, Spikehead? Spikehead? Just thought it up. Oh. Well, did you just want to see if the buzzer works? Uh, no, I got an address on that guy Diamond Shot. Julio Bassati? Yeah. Well, do you want us to hold a seance while you give it to us by telepathy? Oh, uh, 456 River Street, apartment 7. And you sure are getting grouchy. <laughs> Walt and I piled into the squad car and took off for 456 River Street. There was a chance that the man who wore the roses might live with his partner, Giulio Bissardi. We found the manager, he led us into the apartment, and after 15 minutes of pretty extensive house wrecking, both Walt and I came to the same conclusion. Giulio Bissardi lived alone and liked it. We hit the street pretty discouraged. Well, come on. Hey, uh, hey, Walt. What is it? Look, that old lady down the street. Well, what about her? She's selling flowers. Oh, flowers. well, let's go. That's flowers. 20 cents a bunch. Flowers, gentlemen. Uh, do you have some red roses? I uh, yes. Single red roses that I could wear in my lapel? Yes, 25 cents. Have you ever seen this man? What man? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Drago. I sell him a red rose every evening, fresh. You know where we can find him? Well, what do you want him for? Police. Has Mr. Drago done something? He's wanted for murder. Oh, no, how terrible. He seemed like such a nice man, so generous, he dressed so nicely. He's killed three people. Three people? Do you know where he lives? Three people? Yes, he lives in the next block. I don't know the number. I'll have to show you. Here, I'll take all the flowers you've got. The old flower woman showed us the building, and again we dragged another manager out to let us into Drago's apartment. This time we went in low, ready to shoot if Drago happened to be home. He wasn't. And once again we tore another place apart. Find anything? No, not yet. Get a load of this closet. Drago really dresses. Hey, Walt. Yeah? You find something? Ah, look at this telephone pad. What about it? The writing. Read it. Bunker Hill. Bunker Hill Hotel. That's where my client is. Drago's found him. Walt, go check for the men you got staked out and see if they spotted Drago going in. I'll go in and see if my client's all right. Right. Herman. Herman. Oh. Rick. Over here, Walt. Herman is out cold. Herman? Yeah, the manager. Oh, he looks pretty bad. Yeah, he's really out. Drago? Your men see anybody? No, but he could have slipped in. Now, let's get up to my client. Well, come on. I'm looking for the key. What room? Eleven. Well, it's gone. I had my client locked in. Come on. Second floor. Here it is. Alistair. Alistair, it's Diamond. Diamond, Diamond, get me out of here. He's been here, he's got a key. Where is he? He tried to get in, but I had the chain lock on. Then he tried to break it down. I pushed the furniture in front of the door. Get me out, please. Just take it easy, we'll try and break it down. The furniture's still there. Well, get it out of the way. Yes, yes. 
I don't know where he went. Is there a fire escape? Fire escape? Yes. Yes. There's an escape right outside my window. Good heavens, Diamond. Just keep moving the furniture. But the fire escape... Just move the furniture. Walt, yeah? you stay here. I'm going out on the fire escape. It figured. If Drago couldn't get past the furniture, he'd get in another way. I ran to the end of the hall and out on the escape. I turned the corner of the building and started for my client's room. He's on the escape! He's coming down! I can hear him! Get me out! Get me out! At first I thought my client had heard just me. But then I saw him. Climbing down from the floor above, a gun in his hand. The polished barrel shining in the moonlight. As he reached the window, Alistair went crazy. He's outside the window! No! No, no, please! I leaned against the building and steadied my arm just as he broke the window. No, no! No, no! You killed him. You killed him. Yeah. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> what, Mr. Diamond? Shot him right through his red rose. 